So this is the piece that we're painting today. I used this little bit of Just Breathe in there so that, you know, just to remind us to stop and smell the flowers and settle down a little bit. Uh, this is a really fun piece to paint. The surface is very unique. This one comes from Southern Ridge Trading, which is a Canadian company based in British Columbia. Their website is www.chipboard.ca. She makes some marvelous surfaces and this one is a particular favorite of mine. So the first thing that we're going to tackle for this piece is this frame. This has great impact on it. I just thought that the softness of the flowers and the bumblebees with this heavy looking chain around it was uh, just a neat, a neat look. So this is how this is done. It's actually very simple. So here is our frame. Now, I already have some of the colors in place, but let me show you how this is done. I'm using my texture stencil brush for this, and I'm going to pick up a little of Decorts Extreme Sheen Metallic. This is the 24 karat gold, and it's just literally stippling that color into place. And then with that dirty stencil brush, you pick up some of the copper, which is in the metallics or in the Extreme Sheen, and you stipple some of that in until the colors blend. So you get bits of copper and bits of gold all over this frame. Then you just set it aside and let it dry. The next step is to add some patina to this and it's actually very, very simple. I'm using a, a large Mezzaluna and a little bit of my favorite Americana color. This is Bahama Blue. And you're just going to scuff a little of this color onto various areas of this chain. Don't have to really think about where it's going, just make sure that each of the links gets a little of that color. And it can be as strong or as weak as you want. I like it to be quite strong in some places, but every link should get a little bit of this. And if you whoopsie like I just did, not a big deal. So you just continue to go around the chain, sorry, and you add that Bahama blue to the various links all around the outside edge. So I have one here that is already dry and ready. So you can see it sort of gives it sort of an oil stained look all the way around. Now your next step is to start dividing some of these links and I'm going to do that with a little bit of carbon black. I'm using the fluid acrylic for this in the carbon black. And I've got here, um, I'm using a small angle. This one is a 3 8 in the black gold, super soft. And you're going to start shading and separating these links. So right here, I'm going to put a little shadow. And again on the other side. So it separates this link from this one. This one back here is laying on top of the one I just shaded, so I'm going to put a shadow here and here so that they're now separated. So wherever those links connect or overlap, you're going to put a float of that carbon black. And this will start separating all of those links. It actually works up very quickly. Just keep in mind that some of these links in this chain overlap. So you have to make sure that those shadows indicate that. And that will help give you lots and lots of realism. And it doesn't take much, just a light shadow will make a world of difference. I'm going to do it here. And here, I just want you to be able to see how these little floats make such a tremendous difference 
to the end result. Take your time doing this. There's no rush. And besides, the neater and tidier these floats are, and the more accurate they are, the more realism you're going to get. And I just laid mine right in the gold paint. <laughs> there we go. Not used to having my palettes quite so close. Okay, so I think we can zoom in here a little bit. You can see how that, let me pull it down here. You can see how much that's already making these links appear a little more realistic. So take your time putting in those floats. So now we've got all these chains and links separated. So you have to add a little bit of a highlight to these. I'm going to do that with a small dry brush and a little bit of warm white. And this is just going to pop them a little further. I don't need a lot of color on the brush, but I do need a little. And in the center of that link, those long links, I'm going to put a little highlight and it gives them a little more elevation each time. And you just continue around the frame until you have it completed. So not that difficult, but it is very effective. Now I'm going to tell you something about this frame that you might not know, and that is that there's only one way for this to go on right. So before I start painting my pieces, I line them up so that I know that they work. And then once they're in place, I add a little paint to the edge. So I've got a little blue mark here on the edge of it, on the edge of my frame. And I've also put one where they line up. So I'll grab the other one. So where is it? It's here somewhere. There it is. So I have this line and then this line right here, they line up perfectly. Maybe, maybe they will, maybe they won't. Maybe I flipped it over. <laughs> okay. It's here somewhere. Now I lost my blue line. There it is. Okay, so make sure that you line it up so that the frame fits in the proper place and then mark the edge so that you can come back to it easily. Otherwise, you'll drive yourself crazy trying to get it back in place. So next step for this is very straightforward. We're going to use that vintage note stamp from Stampendous and we're going to use a brayer and some asphaltum. I know you're very surprised by that. So I'm going to roll the asphaltum out with the brayer and then that's how I'm going to load my stamp. Just roll the paint on like that. And then I'm going to position my stamp just like so. I'm not looking to get it absolutely perfect. I just want to fill the space. When you run out of color, just reload the stamp. I'm not looking for a perfect stamp. I actually prefer if it's not. And then I continue and cover the whole surface with that stamp. So this is what I end up with is and the stamps everywhere on that surface. So I take a minute here and finish this off. It doesn't take long. And neatness doesn't count. Perfection is to be avoided at all costs. There we go. So it's like I said, it doesn't have to be perfect. 
It doesn't even have to be everywhere. I just kind of like the continuity. Okay, so I'm going to make a little bit of noise here for a second and just dry this quickly. Now my base color for this, I forgot to tell you that, was um, buttermilk. I've got two coats of buttermilk on here and then it is stamped with the asphaltum. Now you can use a stamp pad if you don't have asphaltum. It doesn't really matter what color it is. I just kind of like the, the combination of having that asphaltum and the light or the buttermilk together. And now I'm going to add some antiquing to this. And I'm going to do that top towel and a little bit of water or glaze. You can work with either or. I've got some shop towel here. Now I usually cut it or tear it into quarters and make myself a nice little pillow. This is my high tech applicator. And I get it wet. I want it wet. I don't want it drippy, but I do want it wet. And you're going to take that asphaltum, and it's a fairly generous amount, and you're going to, in a circular fashion, apply some color around the outside edge of this surface. Just like that. Now, I usually do this in one or two passes until I get the depth or the darkness that I want in the outside edge. And then I use that back heel of this cloth with that little bit of water just to blend the edge so I don't have a, a solid line all the way around. It just sort of softens that boundary between that bright spot in the center. There we go. I ended up pulling off more color than I wanted to, but there we go. I can always put it back on. So I just continue until I have a nice gradient from dark to light from the outside edge and then the center should be almost full strength buttermilk almost so if you get a little in the middle that's okay too but it should be lighter than the outside edge and you are going to get dirty when you do this that's okay. You don't get dirty. You didn't have fun. Okay, so I think I'm just about where I want to be. Let's soften that edge just a little. There we go. So from this point, if you wanted it darker, just let this dry and then you can float around the outside edge if you wanted a, a more darker shadow on the, uh, on the edge. But from this point on, it's time to trace and transfer your pattern. And I already have mine on. So the most difficult part about this entire piece is actually doing this daisy. Not the painting part, it's the sculpting part. So we're going to use a little bit of Dacquart's Media Gesso. It's super thick and it's perfect for this kind of thing. So I'm going to use a number eight wave filbert. And you can see this one's got a serrated edge. There's a reason I use this brush. So you're going to pick up a small amount of the gesso on this brush, and you're going to just tap it into place like this. 
so that it creates some texture in the center of that flower. And you take up a little more. It's a fairly heavy application in here and it is going to have some texture without even trying it's going to create texture and that's what we want. So I just continue around until I fill up all of that space in the center of the flower. And I keep moving that gesso around so that I get all of that really cool texture. Now here's that dip in the center. I don't fill it completely, but I do take some of that gesso down in there. Not quite as heavily textured as the rest of it. But you do want some in there. So now we're ready to start doing the petals of the flowers. And for that, I like to use either a nice big round brush or um, you can use a filbert if you like. I'm going to grab, this is a number six. This will do nicely. So I've got uh, a little number four, sorry, a number four filbert. And I'm going to take that gesso and I'm going to fill in the petals. And you notice when I'm pulling this gesso, I'm letting all of that texture remain. I'm not trying to brush it smooth. I want those brush marks. I also leave a small space between the petals just to keep them separate. All the way around. So you just continue until you have all of these petals filled in with the gesso and then with that small space between each of the petals. Just like that. Make sure that those brush marks remain. The gesso stays wet for a while so you can fiddle with it until you get what you want. But I like having that long vertical stria in the petal. Just like that. It's okay if it doesn't give you full coverage. That's all right. I like to go back in with a little bit of warm white after the fact, just to clean up any little edges and give it some nice fullness. So you can go do the entire flower, all of the petals and the stem with the gesso. And then you're going to move to the bumblebee. The wings in here get a nice coat of the gesso. And again, I pull it so the stria come toward the center of the body of the bee. It just keep, gives them a little bit of texture and keeps them looking interesting. And I do the same thing to the body or the thorax of the bee, brush a little of the gesso in to those areas that will be yellow on the bee. And the same with the stem. Make sure you pull it all the way and fill in that space. Okay, so you continue until you have all of the petals, the center of the flower, the stems, and the wings and the body of the bumblebees completely filled in. So I have one already completed. And you can see that it, it actually comes out quite nicely. But interestingly enough, if you were to stand this up, you can see all of the stria and the lines and the texture in the center of this flower. And it's going to make your shading much more effective. I love this piece. It's just such a fun piece to paint. So we have this very pretty daisy. We're going to start with the center. And I have primary yellow in the fluid acrylic. It's a very bright yellow. And I'm going to use my filbert again. And I'm going to paint the center of that flower just like this. 
And the first thing you're going to notice is how that color grabs all of that texture. So it will immediately create even more visual texture in here. Just like so. I love this yellow. Very bright, very sunny. Gorgeous color. So there, look at the texture showing up in that center of that flower just with one color. So we're gonna give that a second to dry. And in the meantime, remember all those spaces that I talked about, leaving all of those spaces right here? The, if you're worried about them being not quite opaque enough, take a little of your warm white and you can go ahead and paint right over top of your petals, over top of those lines and fill in all of those great little spaces that you have. Because your shading is going to hide a lot of that, but you don't want a harsh line in there. So I'm gonna find it nice. Let's go back to my 3 8 So in this daisy, I like using this cobalt teal hue. I love this color. So the cobalt teal hue is going to be the color I use to shade these flowers. And if you watch closely, down in here, look what happens when it hits that texture in the petals. It enhances it drastically. And it gives it a really nice realistic look. It makes it far more interesting. So I'm pulling that cobalt teal hue in and I'm shading my flowers with it. Now I've thinned it with a little bit of water so it doesn't, um, doesn't go too strong. And in here, wherever those petals overlap, I'm going to put that shadow in. And that little bit of texture makes all the difference. You can see all of those brush marks popping up and it just creates really great visual interest on this flower. I pull in up here where that overlaps, under here to divide those petals. And I haven't had to reload my brush. I'm still working from the same little puddle. Oh, spoke too soon. Now we're going to deepen these shadows with a little bit of a spaltum but this does work very quickly. Now we've got all of our petals, almost all of our petals separated. Just put one more here to concern myself with. separated rather nicely. Now that same blue that I used on the petals, I also use on the wings of these bumblebees. So I put a little, little color close to the thorax, right there. And you do that for both the bumblebees. like that. So 
So while we're waiting for that to dry, I'm going to take a little of that green gold and I'm going to base my stem. Although you don't need to have a white base coat underneath these fluid acrylics, it does help make the colors really pop. Shows them off to their best advantage. So that green gold is such a pretty color. High yellow content. It's really gorgeous. And it works well with this daisy. So I think our center is dry. We can start working on that. So I didn't have any vermilion. The instructions call for vermilion, but I was out. So I'm going to use a little pyrrole orange instead. It's not quite as opaque as the, as the vermilion, but it will work just as well. So I want to put a float of that gorgeous orange along this side of this daisy. And you can see that that darker color over top of that texture settles in really nicely and gives you lots of visual interest. I want to pull a little bit in the center, but just a little. Just like that. Now that same orange is going to go on our bumblebees as well. But we're going to give that a minute. Now I'm going to pick up some asphaltum. And now we're going to start separating those petals even further. Now I'm thinning this asphaltum out quite a bit. I don't want it too, too strong. Otherwise we'll just end up with brown daisies. So I'm going to start right here and just a weak float underneath those areas there. So this is where you start separating carefully, separating all of these petals. And keep that float weak. And don't worry too much if you get some of that color out on the ends of the petals. We're going to highlight those tips anyway, so don't worry. Now wherever that blue is, we're going to put a weak float of that asphaltum. And it's going to do two things. It's going to enhance that texture even further but it'll also deepen the shadow around the details of this flower. Asphaltum is a great toning color. It's ideal for things like this. It'll enhance textures and enhance colors without burying them completely. there. I really like 
how asphaltum changes the appearance of other colors especially when the the layers you use are fully transparent a couple of spots here i missed there we go now that asphaltum has to come up and go over this center so we're going to subdue this orange a little it's going to give it a nice earthy warm look doesn't kill the color but it does tone it down just a little bit and i'll do the same in here but you can see how that asphaltum catches on that texture that we created with the gesso so it, it does a little of your work for you, creating some interest and something different. I'm going to pull a little up there. Now, if at any time some of these colors get a little muddy looking or a little too subdued and you want to strengthen them, because of their fluid acrylics are so much easier you can do exactly that you can go back in right over the asphaltum and you can strengthen those shadows with the cobalt teal hue just like that so now we have to get a highlight on to these petals and this is an opportunity to clean up any little areas that you're not thrilled with and for me, that's always these edges next to the shadows. I want those to be nice and clean. And so I can take a little of that warm white and just put a nice float along that edge right there. So that now I've got a cleaner contrast between the petal underneath and the one above it. And it highlights my flower at the same time. And I can do the same thing here. That little bit of white makes a world of difference in how this comes together. This will help you keep those beautiful, crisp, clean edges. Just like that. And make sure to bring that white right out to the tip of the petals. This is where you get to clean up everything and make them nice and sharp. So you just continue to work those petals until you get nice clean edges, nice bright highlights, don't be shy if you feel that the shadows need to be jumped up a bit, go right ahead. Pick up a little extra color. If at any time it's too strong, you can just wipe it off. Now when you have a look at these little bumblebees, we want to carry some of the color from this flower out. So what we're going to do with these bumblebees is take that primary yellow, and I'm going to put just a light coat of it on the thorax of these bumblebees. Just like so. The nice part is they're transparent, so they you don't have to worry too much about that color getting over the black on these bees. So, there we go. A little yellow in the derriere. Now these guys also need to be shaded a little bit with that same orange that we used on the center of the flower. 
it's just going to be a little bit weaker. And I'm going to put a little flow of it there, down onto his bottom, so to speak, and a slightly narrower float up the other side. I want to keep that bright yellow towards the center of the body and the shadows towards the outside edge. It helps give the bump will be a little more shape and it also doesn't dilute the color of the bee. Now I'm going to take my asphaltum yet again. I'm going to come back up here because I'm not thrilled. I want to deepen this a little more. There we go. I want that center to be a little stronger. And that same color is what you're going to use to shade these bees. So again, it just subdues that bright, bright orange and bright, bright yellow just a little bit. And I try to keep the center of that bee the brightest portion. just pulled all my paint off. It wasn't quite dry. I'm gonna give that bumblebee a chance to dry and then I'll come back and put the color back in. So now that we've gotten to that point we have to really start deepening these shadows. So this back here is going to be the deepest portion of it and we need those shadows to be quite strong. This is all about layers. Getting layers of these colors in. But that texture has to be there. That little touch of blue has to be there. It keeps this from being getting too muddy looking or too brown looking. Just like that. So it's all about putting in those layers. So you just continue to deepen all of these shadows and build up that texture. So the more layers of transparent color you put on, the more depth you get. So you'll continue to work until you've got some fairly strong shadows if you look at this. These are very strong shadows, but it's all done in thin overlapping layers. If I were to put it all on at once, it would look very dirty and heavy, and we don't want that. So, we just continue to put in thin, overlapping layers of color. And this helps build those nice, strong shadows without looking too heavy or too dirty. So once you've got your petals in and you've got them, all of these shadows to the strength that you want, in here and at the outside edge of these flowers, now it's time to start adding some of those little details. And those details are done with either a liner brush or a rigger or a small round. And it's just this simple. I'm going to just use some very light 
dip dots of warm white to highlight the edges of that flower in the center. I like to take it up a little bit onto the outside edge, onto those petals. Just find it softens the center of the flower very nicely. Now those bumblebees down here, they need a little bit of highlighting too. So I'm going to grab my angle. Now I'm picking up a small amount of warm white and it's going to be heavily thinned. It doesn't have, it's not full strength. And I'm going to put a little float at the top edge of each of these little segments on the bee's body. Just like that. Just a simple little highlight. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's just enough to catch that light. And then with that warm white, we have to make them a fuzzy butt. I, I like calling these fuzzy butt bees. So your angle is going to have a little bit of warm white in it and you're going to stand it up on its chisel edge, right on that yellow portion and where the black meets. And you're just going to touch a little bit of a highlight along there. And it just brightens him up a little bit. Keeps him from looking a little too, pardon the expression, black and white. So give him a second to dry. And this is where my favorite pen comes in. I love these. These are um, a Uniball Signo. It's a 0 0.38. And it has a stainless steel ball and really great black, Japanese black ink. And I just put a sketchy line around the wings of my bees. You can do it as dark or as light as you want. That's entirely up to you. I just like how it gives them, I don't know, just a softer look. A little sketchy line. And I do the same thing to the thorax. Just a little sketchy line all the way around. And in some of the details, just makes them soft and fun. So any little areas that you feel just aren't crisp or clean enough, this is a great way to add some interest to those areas. And it makes great fuzzy butt little bees. Now this little guy out here is just there to give an indication of distance. That's all he's there for. And he's a shadow because I didn't want him to be the same size or exactly the same shape as these little guys. So this little fellow helps keep that balance, the continuity, but at a distance. So it doesn't look like we have three bumblebees stuck here. It gives the impression that he is off in the distance, perhaps checking out another flower. So some finalizing a few things. Um, in this case, I'm using thalo green blue. The pattern calls for thalo green, which we actually don't have, but it is thalo green blue. If you don't have that, you can use the plantation pine in the Americanas, or you can use sap green. But since I had this, I'm going to use it. So a little shadow underneath this petal, like so. It's a very strong color. And then I'm going to pull a little of that color down the back side. I'm trying to keep it as fine and as light as I can. Down the back side of that stem. I got it all over the background. <laughs> there we go. So loads and loads of layers for those petals. Keep the, wherever you put a color, you're going to have to go over it with a little bit of asphaltum because that's what I'm using to marry this whole thing. This is the one color that every single element on this piece has in common, and it's asphaltum. So when you put that rich brown over top of that green, 
it subdues it and gives it an earthy feel. And come back up. So myself, I would just continue to putz with these flowers until I'm happy. I do like the look of this. And I want them to be fairly deep. And these shadows back here around the top of that flower, separating all of these petals. Don't forget those highlights out towards the edges. Those are very important. That's what's going to give you that nice, clean, crisp finish at the edge. Okay. Now with just a couple more things to talk about um, with this, and one of the most important is getting that separation from the background. And again, that is with, with some eschfaltum. So I like to take my shadows darkest in towards the lowest point toward the flower, and then let it sort of run out towards the edge. And these little shadows will help clean up little rough areas, but it will also lift the flower off the surface. So all of those shading, flower, shading around that daisy on the background is done with thin floats, overlapping floats of asphaltum. So the one last element we have is the Just Breathe, which is this little bit here. This Just Breathe is actually in the pattern packet, and I like to cut it out. Um, you can cut it out with straight edge or tear it if you want to, uh, but I like using those edging scissors. It just gives you an interesting finish. So I'm gonna cut mine out. My scissors aren't cooperating. There we go. So I have them cut out and placement is pretty simple. I like to put it just above that bumblebee to the left hand side and I'm going to use Decor's matte medium to put that on with. And my favorite tip with this is always get that paper wet. So I'm going to grab one of my fugly brushes favorite fugly brush. Get it good and wet. I'm going to take a little of that matte medium and I'm going to brush it out where I want this to be placed. Nice and even. I don't want a ton of it there. And I'm going to get this wet. I'm just going to dip it in the water. And then I'm going to lay it into place. The one thing I do want to make sure is that it's straight. There we go. I think that's pretty good. And then I'm going to take that wet brush with a little bit of that matte medium and brush right over it. The reason I wet it is if I drop dry paper into wet medium, I get all sorts of buckles and ripples and bubbles, and it just doesn't lay nice and smooth and nice and flat. So if you get the paper wet first, it'll already be stretched when you put it on, and then it won't do that. And then it will dry nice and smooth on the surface as well. So you would give the entire piece probably a, a couple of hours at least to dry well. And then once it's completely dry, you can apply spray varnish or you can brush a coat of the matte medium over top of it or even a decoupage medium or your favorite varnish will fill it, finish it nicely. Once that's done, then all you have left to do is to mount your frame to it. And I've done that. I used a little bit of E6000 to glue my frame in place. And then I sprayed the entire thing with two light coats of Decor's matte spray just to set everything and to protect it. It really is just that simple. It's just time consuming. Use a little of your time. Take your time with the floats, the shadows, adding those colors, and I promise you, you're going to be very happy with your piece. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did.